and think about when making them is um, how people read them, which obviously is super important. Like I think I always want to make sure that people are reading the comics correctly in order to get the joke. Like if people understand what I'm trying to say and they don't like the joke, that's one thing. Um, like I just, I'd rather that than they missed the joke because of the way I executed it. So with multiple panels, I think it allows you to pace your joke how you want it to be read. So for example, in this one, it says, ew, I'm terrible at reading these live too. That's why I like, <laughs> however you read them in your own head is the correct way, not how I'm reading them. But ew, roadkill, no car kill so like by breaking the this second and third panel up it forces the reader to add a beat there as opposed to like this could be a one a one panel comic ew road kill no comma card kill car kill um but i think that the punch lands better by breaking it up like this and again when making a comic you can dictate how your comic is read based off of you know, how you break out the panels. Um, here's another example of that, where the cat says, I'm just a lone cat forced to live a life of solitude. And then before the cat hisses at the, the owner, like the panel without any dialogue in it forces the reader to take a beat. And I think that definitely makes the joke land harder by having that beat. Um, so it's not always just filling up four panels for the sake of filling up four panels. I think that, um, it's a case of like taking advantage of it and again, forcing your reader to read the comic the way you intend to. And just one more of these ones to show, um, how panels can be used to dictate pacing. So one snail says, I feel like I have this thing on my back weighing me down. You mean your shell? Yes, my inability to come out of my shell. Again, like this could be condensed into one or two panels, but I think by having it in four panels, it um, it forces you to read, like to put a beat between the last two panels makes the joke land harder. Um, so that's a little bit about rule of threes and pacing. Uh, I don't know if you guys had any questions about that before I go on to like the last little bit about how I approach writing. We do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, sure. Nicholas asks, do you start with the joke and then illustrate it? Usually I have an idea of what the joke is. Like I want to make a joke about, so that's funny you ask, ask it during this one because um, I thought the joke was going to be about the shell, um, like weighing the snail down. And then uh, weighing the snail down and then the whole thing about the snail coming out of its shell like that was added after I started drawing it or after I did a couple of sketches so sometimes it just starts with a premise of like I want to do a joke about this for example like this week I did a joke about a um, crows taking candy like uh, out of a jack out of a like pumpkin for Halloween and um, I did so many versions of this comic because like I just wanted to draw that scene and then I was like, I could fill in any kind of dialogue here. Um, that's not typically how I write them. It's usually like I have an idea for a joke and then I start drawing it and then figure out um, what the layout will start being. And then sometimes the joke evolves from there. Good question though. Um, if, was there anything else about pacing or I can talk about a little bit about this last bit? Yeah, go for it. Sure. So this is just my own rule um, when writing comics. But again, it's not just the fact that like writing stuff for Instagram or for social media where you have to condense everything, not just for people's attention span, but just for the lack of space. Like I actually prefer to write that way where it's like have as little dialogue as possible and always cut stuff out where you can. Um, and like, and if possible, have the expressions, um, have the expressions show what the joke is. Um, and also like, let your reader digest something and don't always, you don't always have to spoon feed it to them. 
So um, as I'm talking over this, I can give you guys a second to actually read this comic. Um, so it's the one cat says, I jump on the table. She takes me off the table. I jump on the table again. She takes me off again. It's a game we like to play. So like in this comic, the cat can be, this cat in the last panel, the black cat can say something like, um, it's not a game. She wants to get you off the table. Like you can really hit someone over the head with what you're trying to say. But I think just leaving the empty space um, is more enjoyable for the reader. Uh, and here's an example, like without any dialogue, it just makes the reader like digest the joke on their own. Uh, I think, which is great. <laughs> Again, not hitting someone over the, over the head with the joke. That's actually one of my favorite ones. This is based off of a true story. Although my cat doesn't look like that. Um, this is, I really like these two comics again. I, I, I prefer less dialogue. This one, excuse me, do you know how to get to the person throws bird seed on the pigeon and the pigeon just stares. So this one originally in its first, uh, first version, the pigeon in the last frame was saying, um, okay. Or I could say, um, thank you. Like any, there are several different di like, uh, options for dialogue I could put in there, but I definitely am happy with the ultimate final version of no dialogue where again, like just this little squint in the pigeon's eye just communicates everything that needs to be said. So it's like dialogue at that point would be not, not only redundant, but, uh, I think would, I kind of, I want to say cheapen it a little bit. Um, so again, that's just three things that I keep in mind are at least my style of writing jokes. Um, like I use the rule of threes a lot, uh, specifically for this format. It works well. Uh, I like to intentionally dictate the pacing by using, um, you know, multiple panels. And lastly, I really think that less is more most of the time. There are a couple of exceptions when I think the repetition of the joke is funny, but I think in this format, it's, it works, it works really well to let the character, let the like subtle, um, like the subtle ways you can kind of express something with a little bit of emotion in the characters um, speaks a lot more than, than dialogue. I have a question from David Alanis. They're asking, how do you know when a joke is better for a three panel versus a four panel? Um, if I ever feel like I'm putting in a panel just for the sake of putting it in, then same thing that I was saying about dialogue, I would say less is more. I, I do think that people tend to enjoy reading um, multiple panels more than one. Um, sometimes like, I think that my comic has evolved over the last two years to mostly be four panel comics because like, I feel like people liked that pacing of reading as opposed to just looking at a picture and then reading the joke. Um, but as like a rule of thumb for myself, I think that again, less is more. If it, if the joke can be told in one panel, there's no sense in dragging it out. Only if it, you know, only do it to me if it makes it funnier. Yeah, were there any other questions about um, writing or coming up with ideas? Yeah, there's another one that came in from Milena. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Hopefully I pronounced it right. They said, does using more than four panels work? I'm starting to draw short comics, but I usually draw six or 10. Yeah, so I actually think that this has been a pattern more recently in a lot of comics that I follow where people are just using the full full panel for an in Instagram and then using the swipe feature to have as many panels as you want. Don't quote me on that. I actually don't, don't know how many panels Instagram lets you have, but it's more, it's more than four. Um, so I think that if you don't have to compromise your joke for the format, like write your joke in its best form and then, um, 
figure out how you can tell that tell that joke like if it's a case of having each panel be you know swipe then do that and i actually think that that is a great way for people to read web comics i just never made the switch because as like an instagram user i I still am not used to the format where like what if I'm scrolling, I don't assume automatically I'm going to swipe to read a comic. And um, a little bit, a little part of me is hesitant to make that full switch to, um, you know, using the swipe feature. Um, So I would say just, you know, tell your joke the best you can, the way you think fits best. And then um, see how, see if like you're, um, your platforms that you're using can accommodate that. Awesome. Thanks. We have more questions, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead and continue with your presentation. We'll get into these a little bit later. Okay. I, um, so I'm going to actually draw a comic and again, this is going to be like 100% live. We'll see how it goes. I, when I draw a comic, I always have, I have a billion of these notebooks and I sketch ideas as fast as I can when I have them. And I draw them really sloppily. And if I ever show people my sketches, I say that like I draw them sloppy because if anyone finds one of my notebooks, they can't steal any of my ideas because they can't read my handwriting. Um, but in reality, this is just, <laughs> I just take notes really sloppily. So this comic, I'm going to draw for you and we'll see if it evolves a little bit. I, a little closer, I don't know if you guys wanna try reading it. If you can read that, I know the handwriting is a mess, but this is how 99% of my comics start. And it also helps me visualize the actual layout. And I feel like this one might actually change. Looking at it right now, I can see that here, I want the dog crawling under the fence. And I know to draw this fence, that dialogue is gonna have to move. But um, we can just jump into it if we, we look at the uh, Photoshop now. I have these boxes pre-drawn. So I'm also going to draw really sloppy in, in this as well. Uh, I get, just because I don't want to waste time on drawing something before I figured out what the actual layout is. So if I'm like, let's actually, I also don't use pressure sensitivity on my, um, on my pen. I think because when I started drawing the comics initially, I, my it wasn't this tablet it was a much older one that didn't the pen didn't work so the pressure sensitivity didn't work and then i was like i already started a style i'm going to stick with it which is also a good tip if you're going to make your own comic um doesn't mean it can't evolve but it's always good to uh just stick with something so again i'm going to draw it really really crappy just to see what the layout is <laughs> And I'm like, I got a snake here. So the gist of this joke is this dog is going to be saying like, I heard maracas, where's the party? And then we see a snake. It's clearly like coming from the snake's rattle. So I'm like, I want to be able to see that this dog is coming out from under a fence. So I'm probably going to put the dialogue here. And then we're going to reveal that it's, it's a snake with a rattle. And the snake is saying like, it's my rattle. I'm using it to, th to warn you that I'm super dangerous. And then we're gonna have the dog be like, saying nothing actually. So actually, I really want the face to look kind of like dumb here. And then, yes, I'm going to copy and paste that really crude drawing. 
I want these last two frames. Like I just want the eyes to change and him to be like, so no party. Actually, let me put the dialogue in here because the first thing I'll do, like I said, is trying to figure out what the actual layout of this comic is. And in the first panel, if he says, I heard maracas, I, hope I, I think I spelled that right. Where's the party? So actually right off the bat, I think I might lose the, um, I don't know if I need to see the snake in this frame and it might be more important to have the like space for the dialogue, but I'm not sold on either way yet. And then in this frame, he's saying, um, that was my rattle. Uh, warning you. Uh, I'm dangerous. So, already veering off of the sketch a little bit and kind of thinking this out loud, um, but I'll try to like narrate my thinking so you guys can kind of hear what's going through my head as I'm doing it. So again, like I want to see that this is a fence. Not that that's like a part of the joke. I just like the idea of a dog like scooting under the fence and then asking the snake that. I don't know. Otherwise, like the snake's walking up to the, if the dog were just walking up to the snake, I feel like it, it would read differently. Um, so if I want that to be a fence, I don't want dialogue over it. I'm going to have the, so no party. Jimmy, Antonio's wondering, do you have a rule of placement for characters? No, I, I think it's just like, as long as I can fit the dialogue, I that's the important part I'm trying to do here. And like you guys are seeing live, like the fact that I had the snake in the first frame it kind of lets people know that I don't, I'm not saying it gives a joke away in the first frame, but like, I like the idea of the snake's head there, but I would sacrifice that for having the, the dialogue more prominent. Um, but I definitely don't, the only rules I have when drawing are I keep, you know, the, my pen is always set at four. I don't use, have pressure sensitivity on and my backgrounds are always are never colored and my characters are always colored. And that's just a, since I draw like tons of different dogs, cats and other animals, the only consistency I think is my style. And so I think it's important to have something that's easily identifiable. And I think those things would be like the font choice I have and the fact that my characters are colored and the backgrounds aren't. Did that, sorry, did that answer the question? <laughs> Yeah, that was great. Cool. And then I have a follow-up question. Just sure. Since you're putting in the text right now, Bonnie wants to know, is it a common thing not to use thought balloons? Um, so I think that like some people free, like freehand draw them really well. Um, I, another, I said that those are my only rules I lied. The other rule I have is I never use the only time I'll use like a shape tool or a line tool is if I'm drawing like a draft myself. Like I, everything I do has very like, a, I would say sloppy, but I, I, I guess maybe like hand drawn is the better, better terminology uh, look to it. So I don't do speech bubbles also because the fact that I never color in my backgrounds, it's very minimalist. Like I only draw something like if it, I mean, majority of the time, if it at, if it's necessary for the comic, the fact that I have so much empty space, um, leaves space, leaves areas, blank areas for text. Um, so I 
just personally don't do speech bubbles. I have nothing against them. I think they look really cool. And I think some people are much better at drawing them than I am. Um, and feel free to add any questions as, as you know, as they come up, I'm just going to show you guys how this goes from a super crude sketch to I'll probably do one more pass of like getting a better idea of the shape of the characters. Like right now I, he's looking a little bit like a French bulldog and I'm picturing a chihuahua for this. So I'm going to make him look a little bit more like a chihuahua and this will probably be like my second rough pass. So chihuahuas have big ears and like, actually I'd probably go bigger eyes. We have another question about sure. your text. Do you have your own font or do you use whatever you have? Um, so I, I use a font called, it's called Bacobi, I think is how you say it. And it's just a, a free font that is like a handwriting style which is the style I, I wanted. I, I didn't make it myself. But I think I would definitely recommend like when you're doing a comic, like if it's not your own handwriting, definitely finding something that's not, that's not commonly used. Like find something that you can kind of make unique to your, your own comic. So, he still doesn't look Chihuahua enough to me. Chihuahuas have like really big ears. You nailed the eyes. That does look like a Chihuahua. <laughs> That's like an identifiable thing for sure. Is that like how bug-eyed Chihuahuas are? Um, I don't know if these paws are too big again this will evolve i just want to like be able to picture the comic a little better i also think i could probably go bigger with this um and i might as well center him if i lose the snake before he was off to the side here so i could have room for the snake's head um, but now that the snake is out again i'm not totally sold on that yet i don't think the snake is necessary but I may change my mind. So I said that I don't use a line tool, but whoops. But sometimes I'll just do straight lines as like a guide for myself before I like go over it again. But again, this is to make it look like a fence. We have lots of questions about the font still. I think this is funny. <laughs> okay. Maya That's wants true. to know, how did you decide on a font? What was the process like? I'm wondering that too. Was it hard to pick a font that you would stick with throughout your whole comic? It's a little daunting to pick anything that you're like, I'm going to stick with this for the life of the comic. That's why like, actually when I, when I first made the comic, I was like, what are, I want to do something with characters. And I was like a little intimidated of running out of steam to like, um, you know, writing about one character, but I was like, I can write about animals forever. Um, so that's why I went with animals. But as far as picking a font, I just um, looked at ones that were, there was no like, it was 100% royalty free. There were no, le there was going to be no legal issues using it. And uh, I actually spoke with the person who created the font. She like reached out after seeing my comic, which is pretty cool. Um, but I just wanted a style that looked handwritten and was very legible. Um, that was one thing I ran into when looking at fonts was like, I, again, I don't want people to miss the joke because they couldn't read it. I want them to, if they don't like the joke, it's fine. I just want to make sure that they, uh, I at least had a fair shot at making them laugh by making sure everything was legible and that I drew it correctly. So that's what I would say when picking a font, but yeah, definitely something unique is ideal, I guess. I'm not sold on this. He looks a little, uh, I think I gotta like give him more of a snout, even though chihuahuas have like really little snouts. Do you ever use references when you draw or do you try to draw from memory? 
Yeah, I use um, reference pictures. I'll um, specifically like if I'm drawing a breed, it'll be like, okay, what do, um, not that I'm trying to, I mean, a lot of times I'll just draw like a golden retriever just because I'm like, oh, a lot of people have golden retrievers. But then I was like, I can draw, ex it's easier to draw expressions with a golden retriever kind of because they're, I don't know, they have expressive faces. But when drawing something like, okay, if people are like, this is clearly supposed to be a Chihuahua, I don't want to like miss something obvious. Like, I feel like his forehead might need to be bigger. Yeah. I think that looks a little more Chihuahua. But I still have some, he still has some cleaning up to do. And then, um, yeah, I definitely look at reference images though, specifically for drawing um, animals. I do have some more sketches here. Ooh, I actually just sketched a chihuahua before and I really like how his face looks. So I'm going to try to match that face a little better. But I'm, I like try to look at like, what is the difference between these, this and what I drew that, that is like speaking to all differently to me. But um, we could do that on, a, on the second pass. This part, I think I'll draw, um, see which sketch of a snake I like. I'm just gonna turn that off completely. So we have quite a few questions asking where you find your inspiration and how you come up with your jokes. So uh, like um, initially when I was making animal comics, it was like um, just taking people's and my own like preconceived notions of what, what pets are like or what animals are like and then how do I subvert that or tell that in a new way. And that was kind of early on in the comic. And then now it's more, um, I mean, just, I still try to ground them in something that like people have observed before. That's why I use a lot of dogs and cats and birds and squirrels. It's like things that I have observed and things that I think people can relate to. And I use that as a base. And then I try to, you know, put some kind of twist on that or, um, sometimes I'm like, I want to tell this joke, what animal would be best suited to tell this joke. Um, but typically like when trying to brainstorm something, it's starts in like, what's something that I have observed about animals that I think other people have made the same observation. And if there's a way I can tell that where people are like, oh yeah, my cat's like that. I never thought of it like that. You know, that, that way is kind of an ideal response to one of my comics, I'd say. Um, but yeah, I have two cats that give me inspire a lot of ideas, and um, I'm outdoors a lot. I love I love animals, like I love dogs, I love birds, and I think that just a lot of writing these these ideas kind of comes really naturally to me. As I say that out loud, I, I realize how cheesy that sounds, but it's it's actually true. <laughs> Justine wants to know, has your comic sense of humor always been the same or similar in real life or did you find it evolving? Um, like, do you have a clear tone and voice the longer you make comics? Definitely. I think that's a, a really um, smart way of putting it. I, I think that the comics have evolved um, for the better. I think that just naturally I've been more comfortable with... Um, I mean, when you have an audience, it's like, like, I guess I'm to the point now where I'm not doing, um, one way I've put it before is like all the low hanging fruit jokes, I've kind of used up that bin and now it's like, I have to get a little weirder, sometimes a little darker with the jokes. And I like enjoy writing in this space, but I think that it's definitely evolved for the better. And one thing that I've also noticed, not when just writing, but with looking back at the comics I've done, is that no matter who, what 
animal I'm writing for, it's like clearly in my voice, like there are multiple ways to say the same thing, but clearly it's like said the way that I said it. Um, I wonder if I could use this as an example. So I heard maracas, where's the party? That was my rattle warning you that I'm dangerous. In the last frame, he's like, so no party? In the last frame, he could say some something like, so you mean to tell me that there's no party? Um, like that could be a different way to say the same exact thing, deliver the same exact joke, but it's just not how I talk or how I'd write. Um, and I think that's definitely something where it has naturally just come out over time where clearly this is just how I write. But yeah, really, really good question. Still not in love with this chihuahua, but <laughs> um, let's work on his face a little bit. And then I'm going to copy and paste in the last two frames, but I don't want to copy and paste this chihuahua that I'm not happy with yet. So I know you said nailed the eyes, but I feel like they got to, they need to move because chihuahuas have that like big round forehead. Yeah. Did you guys have any other questions? Did I answer the inspiration question? I felt like that was a little, I don't know if that was too broad of a response, but no, I thought it was not was really good. a formula I follow to write. It's just, um, uh, one thing is that I always have to be very deliberate about writing a comic. I'm not just like out and about and I'm like, oh, that squirrel's doing something funny. That would make a great comic. Like it's always like I'm sitting down and I'm writing a comic right now. Um, it's not like they just come out of thin air. It's very deliberate comic writing time which is usually Sunday nights. I'm liking the chihuahua it's more. more difficult to make a non-dialogue joke? Yes, I think so. But it's like so satisfying when it lands. Um, specifically like the pigeon one that I showed earlier. Uh, like, I just love that this little tiny pigeon eye, especially like viewing this on the phone, like this thing is so small, but like it says all the di more than any dialogue I could put in there. Which yeah, is, is definitely satisfying, but I feel like it's, it's harder to um, come up with those jokes. I love it. I love his little squinty eye. I so I, I'm going to go with the awesome. same the same punchline in this one where it's just like the squint is the like the right emotion for this this bug-eyed chihuahua it's crazy too how like this tiny little pupil again like i really don't draw a lot of detail and i'm still just sloppily drawing until i feel like this is the right emotion but like the placement of the pupil and everything is just like, it totally changes how the comic is read and delivered. On that note of simpler drawings, we have an anonymous attendee asking if it's harder to draw more simpler characters. Sometimes when you're like limited to how you can tell emotion, um, like for people that draw, eyes is just dots like I really love that drawing style but I think that it makes it really for me at least um like expressing emotion so that's kind of why like I will spend the most time in my drawings on oh that's too big on a um just drawing like the pupil and the shape of the eye but yeah I feel like at times it can be limiting especially the other thing is drawing a, depending on what animal you're drawing, drawing an expression is like such a subtle little thing. Like a bird's beak is like to draw a smile. It's like, it wouldn't look, I wonder if I have it in one of those samples. Like it might look weird to draw a beak as a smile, but you can see here like um, in the pigeon, like just the slight, like curve in the line of the beak is like a different emotion. And it's like so, so subtle. 
where to the point where it almost seems like it's not intentional, but it is definitely intentional. <laughs> Sometimes it might not be, but um, uh, both these examples are like played very straight, which I guess is another way I typically tell jokes is like um, they're not typically over the top. Like it's, it could be read very flat, um, more deadpan. So in this, the drawings of the birds, you can see too that like the, the slight curve in the beak and the shape of its mouth, like depending on how that looks could change how you read the dialogue. Um, but that's something super subtle. Did I answer that question or did I go totally off track? <laughs> you answered it. It's a little intimidating to like, like try to draw this chihuahua in front of people, but I definitely think that it's improved. You guys can tell me if you think otherwise. Yeah, let us know what you think of the chihuahua in the chat. Give us some, some people feedback. probably want to like reach into the screen and be like, oh, well, you make his eyes wrong. You're drawing his <laughs> face fair, but I think it's closer. Looks a little skeletor-ish or something. Someone says it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm going to see. So the nice thing about like drawing digitally is like I can see what he would look like with his snout down here and up here. But uh, I actually think I just might make the eyes a little bigger. Yeah, I was just going to say somebody else in the chat said maybe make the eyes a little bit bigger. Yeah, and it's actually like um, it, it will help like ex express the emotion better in the last one, the last frame. Okay. I also don't want it to look like a, I know some chihuahuas look like a rat, but I don't want it to look like a rat. I promise you this will turn into a comic at some point. It's looking uh, great. I actually think the chihuahua looks good. Cool. Um, the other thing is, I noticed the eye. Chihuahua's eyes like actually do bug out. Like it's not like floating here. Also, he should probably look like kind of excited because he's like, or, like he thinks there's a party. So again, like that slight little curve, that slight smile will change how that first line is read. Heard Maracas, where's the party? And... So LD wants to know, how often do you produce your comics daily or do you maintain any bank of ideas as well? So I like ha post a, a finished comic once a week and for a very long time, it was Sunday night. I sit down, I give myself two hours and I finish a comic and so I look back and some of them, that's very obvious to me that I wrote that way. Now I have a little bit of a backlog of ideas where they're very um, loose ideas where it's like, I still have to refine the, like how am I actually gonna tell this joke? But it'll be like, I wanna tell a joke about how ants always like, like do ants just blindly follow the ant in front of them or do they know where they're going? Like that's a concept I have in my head and um, I think that will turn into a joke at some point. Um, if I ever have like a really good joke that I, at least something that I think is really good, I'll like prioritize that and like try to draw it really fast. Um, Cause I have this thing in my head where I think someone else is drawing it at the same time somewhere. Um, but I have a, just again, really loose ideas of potential future comics. Uh, I was like, why is this reading weird? Um, and then I realize it's because the smile, it's like, changes it. But I'd still stick to the schedule. 
uh, of releasing a comic every Sunday, even when, again, sometimes the idea suffers for the sake of sticking to a schedule, but I think that it's been super helpful for me, not just to build up a following, but also to um, just stick with it and like stay disciplined and draw because drawing is very like, uh, like you, it's up to you to, you know, stick with it and be consistent. So just staying to a schedule has just been personally huge for me. Um, where's the party? Yeah, that's a good Okay, so here. Oops. Marissa wants to know, how do you choose which comic to share? Do you have an order or something? Do you keep a flow? Um, the, the comics that I share, it's just like whichever one I, f I finished. Like sometimes, like I just released a Halloween one because um, I was like, oh, it's ha Halloween time of year. I just was like, let me think of a, some Halloween ideas. But um, typically like I don't, what, I have a backlog of some ideas, but I never have a backlog of finished comics. So when I post a comic, I literally just finished it. So whatever comic is finished, that's which one gets posted. It also helps, like, it makes me not, I, like, joke about looking back at some past comics and be like, these are awful, but it's sticking to a schedule, like, it just doesn't give me time to second guess them, which I feel like is uh, kind of fun for you guys to, like, if you look back at my old comics, it's like, sometimes that was like, oh, two years ago on a Sunday night, that's the joke I came up with on the spot, and it never changed from its, like, conception to when it was posted. Um, so that is how a lot of my comics come out, but this one is an exception because we're like working on it right now. But I think that the only thing that potentially might change besides losing the snake in the first frame is this dialogue. Um, that was my rattle warning you that I'm dangerous. Just thinking aloud, like, the dialogue could be something about like, um, that's my rattle warning you of imminent danger. Sounds like a little more, um, I feel like when you hear snakes in movies, like animated movies, I don't know which one's coming to mind, but they always have the same type of voiceover. And I automatically am putting that type of voice, this like sinister voice on the snake, which obviously fits for the scenario. And I feel like saying something like imminent feels more snake language but um i'm gonna leave it for now while we like go to clean it up but again just thinking aloud so you guys can kind of hear what goes through my head as i draw so actually we'll clean this up a little bit more before we go to do a final version do you guys have any other questions yeah, I was going to say, while you clean it up, um, Melissa is asking, why did you choose Instagram as a platform? As an illustrator, I've had trouble getting used to the ever-changing algorithm and knowing exactly what people like and dislike about my art. So that's a great question. And um, I didn't start posting comics on Facebook till I want to say like a couple months into the comic when... I just have this, and I still do actually have this like paranoia of like any platform changing their algorithm and then losing your following, not being able to reach your own followers, uh, Facebook, and um, like feeling you need to be on everything because you don't know which one's going to pan out in the long run. Um, for Instagram, I think that web comics are just like a great. Um, it's like a great means to deliver a web comic, um, specifically like the short form, one, short form ones, like the one that I do. And like, that's where I typically read web comics, like on Reddit and on Instagram. Um, so I did it just because like, that's what I was using at the time. And that was five years ago. And, um, I haven't gone beyond like Facebook, Instagram and Tumblr, but I do. I actually have this written down on my planner to like start Twitter. 
excuse me, because I'm like, what if like Facebook has evolved so much or devolved in the last five years and Instagram has changed so much too, where I think that's a concern for every artist where it's like at any moment you feel like you can lose your reach and like, um, you know, it's, it takes time to build up a following and it's like a, a really intimidating thing to feel like at the will of Facebook or Instagram. But I think that's just the reality of it. And I think the only thing to do is um, like be mindful of your audience and like where that audience is. Like um, I, like I use Tumblr as my website and I found that like, Tumblr had a great community of um, people like artists and people that enjoyed comics. And then I feel like Instagram, I got more of like the pet people, but um, this is just my own idea of uh, as I was posting things, but it could be different for everyone. But ultimately, yeah, it's, it's tough to pick something and just stick with it. But I think just making sure that you're on different platforms was that the right answer? I think that was a good answer. Being <laughs> mindful of your audience is good advice. Yeah. And what people are, where people are digesting, where people are ingesting this type of content. So if you look at people similar to you, um, similar, you know, if you find a comic that you like and that you think would have a similar audience to yours, like see what they're doing. I'm just going to try a couple different looks on this face here. But again, you guys feel free to keep answering, asking questions and I'll do my best to continue answering. On the topic of platforms, Samuel wants to know, have you ever considered using the webtoon format vertical scrolling? Yeah, I think I started a webtoon at one point and then I, I like posted two or three comics on it. And then I abandon it just because I'm like, so like, Oh, another thing I have to post my comic on. Um, but I know most comics I, I really like are on webtoon and I should at 100% be investing time in it. I just haven't yet. But I do like that format of reading, you know, scrolling up to down to read a comic. Um, it like forces you to again the whole thing about pacing when reading a comic like if any if there's any way to read a comic like that's a great way to force the pacing in a good way so we're also streaming to facebook and youtube and we actually have a question from facebook they're asking what kind of Wacom you prefer using i notice you have an intuos pro in your cintiq 16 which would you prefer um, for drawing, the Cintiq is amazing, but I've dr I drew on it into OS Pro for a really long time, and it's also amazing. And the cool thing is they both use the same pen, and this pen is awesome. Um, but for drawing, like it's just it's been so different. So I only started using like a display tablet, like the Cintiq, um, with this year, like six maybe six months ago, and I've just it feels better to feel like I'm sketching as opposed to drawing on something like the Intuos Pro, but both are absolutely awesome tablets. And I can say that um, not just because this is like a Wacom event, I have used other tablets and I like really, I like love the weight of the pen and just everything feels like really good quality. So can't go wrong with either one, but if you can splurge and get a Cintiq 16, it's awesome. Is that a good commercial? That was a great commercial. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of a fun question. Do you listen to music while you work? Yes. That's why this is really weird to draw without <laughs> listening to music. Like that's the best part about doing any kind of illustration is like, I listen to music nonstop throughout my day. Like, once I'm awake, I'm listening to music. So, and that's like part of what I love about drawing is like, 
I can just put on a playlist and draw and like, it's the best. I know this might be kind of weird because it's silent and you have a couple hundred people watching you instead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you guys get to witness the uh, evolution of this dog because I feel like he's getting better, but I'm still not in love with him. He looks like a little Steve Buscemi to me or something. And also like, I feel like his body, like his legs wouldn't stick out like that from under the fence, but um, we're, we're getting there. I secretly want people to ask like what my music recommendations are, but they, they sound super snobby and stuff. So maybe it's better. No, can. let's hear it. I'm <laughs> sure people are interested. I'm interested. <laughs> yeah, I like, um, still listen to like emo music that I listened to 10 years ago. Oh my God. Yes. Please name some of the emo bands. <laughs> <laughs> the most generic one you can say is like American football. And I still love their first album. Like I, it's such an awesome album to draw to. Um, but it's funny, like all, all these, this like are like the jealous sound saves a day. Bands like that are great drawing bands. Great bands to illustrate too. Nice. Yeah, um, I love a good emo throwback. If you listen to emo music too, let us know in the chat and let us know your favorite bands. Yeah. We need a nice little throwback. <laughs> <laughs> but also like I'll listen to like uh like classical music too, depending on what I'm drawing. But it's all over the place, but I am always listening to music. Uh, he looks like wonky. What am I? Someone just mentioned Evanescence. <laughs> <laughs> I never got into them, but um, who was I listening to that time? I feel like that was like TRL days or something. That's a really throwback. Oh yeah, on MTV. Yeah. No. Oh. So I have another question for you. Akash oh. wants to know, should I follow the rule of thirds while drawing? I'm um, assuming that's in terms of a comic. <laughs> wait, so so the rule of thirds I was saying was like the um and is he referring to the same like the just as far as like comedy delivery where it's like establish a pattern and then the joke is the third one where it's like um like that eagle one like um i can pull it up rule of th oh wait so are you saying rule of thirds like drawing like layout wise or rule of threes for comedy because i think they meant layout wise um, I, the only rule I'll follow is like, I want to, as long as I can fit my dialogue and like, if the expression is really important and you draw it bigger, I'll draw it bigger, but I don't follow any specific layout thing. I do like having a lot of, uh, like negative space in my comics just because I think that's like a way to identify them. But aside from that, there are no rules that I keep in mind in writing. I do like the snake though. Do you have reoccurring characters or are they always changing? It's like in a lot of the dog ones, it's like a golden retriever that kind of looks the same, but in my head, it's, it's like just, it's not recurring characters. Um, but if there were, it would be that golden retriever. Like the cats, I feel like it's always a different cat. I also don't really need to. I just keep turning the layers on and off because I'm seeing like what is not reading correctly to me. Like I like the expression in the third panel and the last panel, and it's like in that first one. 
I was like, nah, I'm like, is he excited? Because he's saying, where's the party? Or is he like already disappointed? I feel like for a chihuahua, he'd be super excited. Yeah, that's true. I'm going to try one, one other. So like, I wasn't joking when I say like, I spend way too much time drawing and redrawing like the most basic of eyes. I know you're, as you guys are seeing this, you're like, what the, like his eye looks exactly the same. You just erased and redrew it. But that's, that's all part of the process. <laughs> no, I was going to say, this is great. We're, we're seeing and we're getting like an inside look on the process because we all see the end result, but this is cool. We're seeing what's leading up to it. I'm just like, I want, I don't know what the, I like, I want this thing to be read correctly and I just have to draw it and then read it myself. David wants to know what's the hardest animal to draw for you? So I think dogs are really hard to draw because everyone has an idea of like what the dog should look like. So it's hard, it's like, this is a perfect example. Like everyone, you know what a Chihuahua looks like. So if this doesn't look like a Chihuahua, it will look wrong. Um, I would say dogs are the hardest and I prefer drawing birds. Cats are also hard, but dogs are the hardest because like dogs can show emotion like with their eyebrows and, and their mouth and stuff. So um, I think it's really hard to nail those things with a dog. Cats just always look angry. No, but I, I think that dogs are, nailing their emotion is particularly difficult for me. Yeah, I can see that. Marie's asking if you've always made animal jokes or if you also incorporate humans. I try to completely avoid having any humans in the comic. I earlier comics I have them in there and like I look back and I really I'm I don't particularly like those ones. Um I like the idea of people being being able to like put themselves in the comic and like not having a drawing of someone in it makes that way easier. Um even if they're I do have to draw a person like I'll just draw their hands or their feet or the back of them. Um, because I think that ideally, like, people will put themselves in the comic and not have a picture of someone to distract them from that. Also, drawing uh, humans is also hard. <laughs> drawing hands is really hard. Yeah. I've definitely tried to draw hands and it's, it's not simple. I think humans are difficult. I'd rather draw a dog. <laughs> so Ronaldo's asking, how do you come to the decision to make the background black and white and the characters in color? Just a style choice to be like, how can I, if I'm not going to have recurring characters, what can I do to make this comic uh, more identifiable? And I think that's kind of a, uh, an easy an easy way to doing the background and the characters different colors is um was an easy way to achieve that the chat is liking what you did with the snake's tongue thanks but he looks more evil <laughs> good because i think that that's important to read this as like that was my rattle warning that I'm dangerous. Like it's funnier for the dog to be unfazed by the danger of the snake. So the more dangerous the snake looks, the better.
Someone was asking earlier, and I'm seeing a couple questions now about this. Do you prefer drawing with like traditional materials like pen and pencil or paper and pencil versus like the Wacom tablet? Like, I think it's really cool when um, you can do something like, um, and I can just do it instead of talk about it, is like doing something like this where I'm like, I want to change, this rattle looks way too big. And instead of erasing it, I can just quickly see, like, does that look more right? And change the size of it. Like, in that sense, drawing digitally is so awesome. Um, specifically for changing the layout of things, too. But I think that, like, looking at the sketch I did of the dog, like, I love drawing in pencil and in pen. Um, it's a little easier for me to draw what's in my head to, to paper than it is on a tablet, but um, they both have their perks. I do think that drawing like on the Cintiq is way more like natural drawing than, than drawing on the Intuos Pro. Um, like drawing on a, on a display tablet is much closer to like drawing naturally. But yeah, bo both I'd say have their perks. But if I had to pick, like I, I do love drawing in a notebook. Like I love picking up my old notebook and just flipping through it to see if I can get any ideas out of it too and just seeing like really sloppy drawings. <laughs> but again speaking of drawing digitally like the fact that i can just do this and like i won't trace i won't just use that i'll use that as a guide like i'll trace it because i want everything to look organic and like hand drawn like i don't want it to look like copy and paste but the fact that i can just copy and paste and maybe change the size a little bit is just so awesome being able to do So I think we have a couple of questions about your preferred software. Sure. That's, they're basically wondering what, what's your favorite? What do you prefer to draw? <laughs> um, so I'm currently using Photoshop. I have been considering making the switch to um, Clip Studio Pro and I've heard great things. I just, since I started drawing on Photoshop, I... Just haven't had time to make the switch yet, but um, yeah, I primarily, I draw in Photoshop currently. And it does what I need it to do. I don't, um, I don't really take advantage of features like in Photoshop. Like, as you guys can tell, my drawings are very simple. And the only thing I'm really using that is huge digitally besides changing the size of things is like using different layers, which you could use in any, um, any program I'm sure any of you guys are using. But yeah, Photoshop is my go-to. So I'm just trying to make this look like a fence. And I'll draw like what details, what few details I do have in my comics um, are all similar, like a similar style. Like this isn't the final layer, but when I, when it is, I'll like go in and add like a little hair here and there. Um, but at this point I'd probably be a little bit and like trying to rush it because I'm like, oh, it's Sunday night. It's already eight o'clock and I need to post something. So I'd probably be doing the final layer now. And I'm almost at that point. I feel like the snake looks a little more 
cartoonish than I usually draw too. Like I still try to keep the animals based in reality a little bit. You it's actually good to see them side by side. You can see how... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do no, you sorry, a... go ahead. They are just wondering, do you ever run into creative block? Yeah, <laughs> um, definitely. Like I, so I drew that, I drew a Halloween comic this week. Um, the last comic I posted, I think that looks much better. Just as far as more, more, the type of characters I draw. And like, I had this idea. I'll just share it with you guys. I do think that I'm going to draw it maybe this weekend. But I wanted to draw something about, again, thinking of Halloween, I wanted to draw something about a, um, about worms in a cemetery. And like all the ideas I had were just like, this doesn't, this doesn't need to be in a cemetery. There's nothing to do with it. Um, so I just couldn't like crack that, like what that idea was. But um, I have just a visual of like a cemetery gate with worms, worms on the other side about of the gate talking about the cemetery. And um, similar to the crow one, I have like, since I have that visual, I, it will help me just come up with the dialogue for the joke there. So we'll see if that turns into a comic. But yeah, definitely have a uh, creative blocks and that that's, that was my most recent one. Still, still existing one. Angelica is wondering if you've ever made a long comic before. Uh, no, I don't think so, actually. Um, yeah, probably the longest was like one of the really earlier ones I did before I was like following the rule of keeping them four panels. I did one that was like six panels, I think. And that was um, a stick bug. I actually really like this comic and I, I ended up editing it for um like i think the one on instagram is shortened but before it was like a dragonfly being like i have super eyesight we should form a team of superheroes and then a amp being like i have super strength and then a grasshopper being like i have super something a moth being like, i have super hearing and then a stick bug's like i look like a stick and then all like all that you have that pause of the, the stick bug being like oh okay like i'm kind of useless and that one, I was like, it doesn't need to be six panels, but I liked that one in its original form being long. Let's see. Someone wants to know how you grew your community online. Um, so the biggest ones for me are like Instagram and Tumblr. Like I just posted my comic and I did nothing. Like I, I, I don't know if I've ever used hashtags on Instagram. It was just like on Tumblr, I think is where I had my first comic is probably the, the first one I did did well. And then by like the third and fourth ones, they did really well on Tumblr and um, I don't know what, <laughs> like uh, why that was, but as I stayed consistent with it, it just like the following continued to grow and it really was just making content and just throwing it out to the internet and seeing how people responded to it. And um, that was early on more recently. Like um, I've gotten a lot of uh, like a positive response from Reddit. And that's somewhere where I actually will like read the comments too. But um, a lot of the following is like, I'll, I'll notice if something does well on Reddit, like it will affect the other social media platforms as well. But yeah, no, there's been no secret. Like, uh, again, I don't even use hashtags. So I'm definitely not, uh, I guess, your typical social media user.
Alexandra wants to know, is there a time of day when you are most productive and do you have a routine before drawing that helps you prepare? I always draw late at night and um, I always listen to music when I draw. That's definitely my, uh, my routine. Late at night and while listening to music and usually drinking tea as well. What kind of tea is your favorite? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm currently drinking apple cinnamon tea. Oh, that sounds tis, good. Tis the season. Yeah, I was going to say very festive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I shrunk his eyes and it, that was not an improvement. I do like the snake though. And I think we're like close to doing the final outline, but it's, I'm just like digesting the comic and seeing what I isn't hitting landing right for me. Like maybe he's looking. Uh, yeah. Feel free to keep asking questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Sure. Um, AM Art says, how do you know when a joke works? Do you test it first, then draw it? I don't know so, what they mean by test it. Maybe like, do you tell it to somebody? Yeah. So I like, um, I'll, sh I have like a couple of people I'll show my comics, but at that point, if I'm like showing someone my comic, it, I'm already second guessing it. Um, so usually if I have like two versions of something, I'll narrow it down to that point where it's like, uh, um, you know, pick between the two. Um, but if I like write a joke and I'm like, I really like this, if it does well or if it completely fails, I'm okay with it because this is how I want to draw it. And I'm, I'm very stubborn in that way, but I will show when I have like two versions of something, I'll, I'll show different people. Samuel's asking, what are your favorite web comics? Oh, I have a, a lot that I enjoy. My favorite one is probably Extra Fabulous Comics. Um, I think it's just consistently so funny. And like I read those and I'm like, I don't know how um, he writes those. Um, there are so many. I feel bad like leaving any out, but the and it doesn't really fit like it might be surprising based off like my comics are very pg but i really like perry bible fellowship and um like pbf comics and extra fabulous so those two are my standouts um and they're both kind of more adult humor but i like a bunch of, i like a bunch of them i actually have uh i love comics i have a bunch of original comics that i've like i've bought and uh, I have like a ton of webcomic artist books too. Um, so I'm just leaving a bunch out because there are a ton of them. Someone in the chat is excited that your fence looks like a fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's important like, that he like um, is clearly climbing under the fence. Still not crazy about how the chihuahua looks, but um what happened because like i think he looks better down here there he is let's just do the final outline and see how he changes from there so as you guys can see that like obviously it's a little more rough and sketched on that version but it was close to final and then when i do this like it will it's this is like a fun part to me because it's like oh it instantly looks like one of my comics just by doing these little this little tiny change nicholas wants to know how you started your career if it was in illustration or humor um a mix of both mainly in humor um 
but I've always loved drawing and it was never like I did a comic strip with some friends like in college that did pretty well but um it was always like a more of a pastime than like oh I'm going to draw really draw comics and and even still like I'm sure you guys are noticing like I still like there are people who are significantly better artists than I am. And I think it's more just like, I have a way to tell my jokes. That's how I think of my comics. So I always think of myself as like a writer first, which sounds like a convenient excuse to justify my drawings, but <laughs> that's the reality of it. You guys can tell me if this looks like if these look like Chihuahua ears. If this looks like a Chihuahua, I am happier with this outline than I was in the previous version. What do you guys think of the Chihuahua now? Let us know in the chat. Someone says, "I think the ears are cute, like a happy Chihuahua." <laughs> Yeah, I think the like cuteness of the Chihuahua makes the joke read better too because it's like he's very innocent looking. Like the fact that he's not scared makes him kind of innocent but also kind of dumb. I also draw all of my paws kind of the same. But they're, um, I know they're not as accurate, but like that's, hey, just like keep them, keeping them consistent. And they aren't very usually as prominent as they are in this comic. Laura says the chihuahua looks like it's ready to go crazy, like every chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. I feel better about that. One last thing I'll look at, not one last thing, but something else I wanted to try was like, am I making his nose too tiny? So just to look at that for a second. Niall is asking, is it important to use shadows and light and making comics? Um, I'll show you guys like when I color it, what little bit of shading I'll actually do. But um, no, there are, are like, I'm sure there are so many examples of comics where like some people, their comics are just in black and white with no shading. Like I think it's just a personal preference. I do very little shading just when I'm like, uh, honestly, sometimes I'll finish a comic like a little bit uh, ahead of schedule, but, um, and I'm like, I enjoy adding the color at the end. Like it's like, oh, the comic's done. And it's just, I can just play around with it. Um, that's when I typically will add shadows and stuff. But if I'm like, oh, I already need to post a comic right now. It's getting really late. You will get a comic with little to no shadows. <laughs> But yeah, just personal preference. And I'm like, should I add in um, like, like a little bit of, like make it look like wood? Maybe. I don't know if it's necessary to have this additional like detail, but Maybe. That is a to be determined. Antonio. I also, and I, sorry, oh, go, ahead. sorry go ahead. No, go ahead. Antonio is asking, do you have many people coming up to you um, saying they have an idea and what do you do in that case? 
That's a good question. I, um, it's easy to be like, I have a, I like don't draw anyone else's ideas because it's like, what if I license this for a greeting card, which I actually have for a ton of my comics. And it's like, what do you do in that scenario? It's like someone else's idea. I feel like it just gets messy really easily. So that's why, excuse me. It's for me, at least it's easier to just be like, here are two comics pick, which one do you prefer? As opposed to like opening the floodgates for other people's ideas. So I guess the answer is politely be like, uh, I don't, I'd rather not <laughs> draw other people's ideas just as a rule of thumb. Also it makes like your comic consistent if it's always in your voice. But yeah, I do have a lot of people tell me this stuff about their pets. But it's usually like, oh, that my, my cat is just like that comic. My dog's just like that comic, which is awesome. I love hearing that. It's so cool that like, and I don't know, I know like people not like are watching from all over the world, but like I sell prints and like 50% of them are outside of the US, which is like so cool to me. Like, I mean, I've sent them to at least, last time I counted it was 15 different countries. And just the fact that like someone has a, a dog in like the other side of the world that this, like this comic, like they thought this comic was exactly like their dog uh, is just super cool. Uh, where were we? Snake. Do you draw comics as a full-time job or secondary? Samuel wants to know. It's like half, half and half. I do a lot of other projects. Um, I'm currently wa working on an animated project. Um, so it's about uh, around ha half of my time. And I said, I, like, typically I'm drawing Sunday nights, but um, it's when it's not this, it's like I'm working a lot on other illustrated illustration and writing projects. But that's what's so cool about, like, when you're doing something like a webcomic, it really just, like, opens the door to so many other things. Ideally, but that's like, uh, fortunately what has happened for me where, um, just doing something consistently like a comic has allowed me to have like continuous exposure to lead to other opportunities. We have a suggestion from Guillermo. They're saying, sure. can you color the nose a pinky red and the fur golden yellow? <laughs> Definitely. I, um, I'll do the outline for the snake and then I'll do the, uh, color because it's going to stay, obviously the color is going to be the same for the next panels. The other three panels, three and four will be really similar to that, that one. Um, actually, you know what? We can just color them now. So I make another layer. You guys can see my weird method of coloring. Like I never use the fill the bucket tool. I always draw mm. so like a yellowish, right? Yeah, they said like the gold. Yeah, yellow. everything I always do, like typically the colors are really, I'll even make do it after two where the colors are really desaturated. Um, But um, obviously the fill tool will not work on most of my drawings because as you can see, there's like no closed shape here. I'll get, I'll get that nose after. This is a great question from Steve. How do you protect your work? Did you copyright the title or is there anything else? Um, like since I got a, I had a book published in 2018, there was like legal stuff done then. Aside from that, it's just um, like keeping my, I always have my URL on my comics. So people definitely delete it, but that's like the, the minimum you can do, I guess, to try to protect your work. 
is that what was it pinky bread or something like that bread, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah that's uh and i've also done a lot of like licensing stuff uh for greeting cards and like merchandising and stuff like that where um that's the only times i've like encountered doing paperwork and like making things more official aside from that now i just publish my comics and put them up on my website and i make sure to put my url on them which is right there on the bottom have you ever come across your comics like on somebody else's page claiming them as their own yeah i have um like a lot of times people will message me on instagram or tag me and say like you know, someone stole it. So actually that cat one of the cat saying like hissing the, let me pull it up real quick. The, someone else's version of this is actually like, um, I think more popular than mine, not this one. Sorry, you guys just seen these, right? Th this one here this like someone else did a version of this one without my url on it and like it's done it's like all over the place but i think that's just the that's just the way of the internet like that's that stuff's just inevitable it doesn't make it okay but <laughs> it, it definitely happens i also think the version of that one that i saw is really funny So if I were to do like a little bit of shading on this one, I would just take like a darker, slightly darker version of this just to like add in a little here. I also like um, using the darker color can be good for adding like detail uh, hair. But a lot of times, like after I'm finished, I make them a little bigger for you guys. I will um, like, this is another thing why drawing digitally is great. I'll like see what it looks like. So I typically go brighter or I will change the, like make it a little more desaturated. Not doing that right now, but that's just to show you guys if you look at my comics uh, one of the things that's consistent through them is like they are not very colorful um, not only is there very minimal color but when there is color it's very uh, like toned down This is an interesting question from Tia. What annoys you as an artist? I mean, that's a good question segueing from the last one. Like when people s take your content and just post it online and take your tag off, it's like the weirdest thing about it is that like it takes effort to like remove a URL from someone's comic. So it's like, uh, it's, it's like strangely offensive when it's like you went through the work you went through the extra effort to remove my name from it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's annoying. As far as drawing, what's annoying when drawing, um, like trying to nail an emotion and not being able to do it is frustrating. Like again, not crazy about the Chihuahua, but Another reason giving yourself a deadline is awesome because at some point that Chihuahua is just done. <laughs> no. And I like personally like the imperfections of like drawing 
that's why I like really like pencil art too, but not having the curves be perfect, not having straight lines be perfectly straight. Like I think that adds something to the comic. Um, I think that maybe his tail should not be connected there. Alicia wants to know, what advice can you give when it comes to keeping the creativity flowing to come up with ideas and jokes? And I said that like being like being an illustrator or being an artist is a very like isolated thing, like to sit in front of a computer and draw or sit in front of a notebook and draw. But I think it's important to like get out and, you know, go out and get, I know it's not as easy right now, but go out for a walk and go out and get coffee. And I think that just like, even if you're not getting ideas when you're doing that, it's like definitely good to just reset your brain. And I'm like super antsy if I don't get out and do something or like exercise and go for a run. I think that all those things that don't seem that like they'd help your creativity. I really think that they do, especially for me. Angela is wondering, do you get any ideas out of the blue while on the road or while you're out and about? And if so, how do you record it so you can remember it later? Do you text yourself or keep a notebook with you, et cetera? I'm always running into ideas at the least opportune moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. That always happens to me. So I'll, um, I will record reminders on my phone um, while I'm driving. And that way I don't have to like type anything. I could just hit the, I have it like on like, do you call it your homepage on your phone? I don't know what you call it, but I have like my audio reminders there. So it's like, if I'm driving, I just like talk to myself. And um, yeah, that definitely, I have ideas sometimes when I'm driving and um, I've asked uh, other people to text me something that like, as I think of it, if I'm driving, like I can say, hey, text me this. So it'll just be like a reminder to myself. It's like not the full comic, but just like that little idea. Like I said, worms in a cemetery. It's like, I don't know what that comic will be, but it's just something that, uh, you know, I need to remember that and it'll like hopefully trigger something later on. But yeah, audio reminder thing is great. There's some people in the chat that are very pleased by your quote unquote chonky snake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to look at a picture now of a rattlesnake because I'm like, what is the patterning on a rattlesnake? Uh, also, I might've made that rattle way too big. Mm. But I can't picture like what the pattern looks like on it. I think it's kind of like that. Yeah, he is pretty thick, especially this part here. I feel like it's not, it can at least make it a little more consistent. I also made this rattle massive, didn't I? Do you have any general tips for beginners? I think the whole thing about like sticking to a schedule, yeah, like finding your own style, sticking to a schedule, those things are just um, like super helpful for me, but also the like, if I could tell myself something like 10 years ago, it would be to like start something as soon as possible. Like sitting on a, an idea, like 
I'm a big fan of like, it's better to put out something that's not polished than to put out nothing or to like, um, to kind of beat yourself up over an idea for so long. Uh, I'd rather just put something out and then, then sit on it. And I know that could be like intimidating at times to just throw something out to the internet, but once you get over it and get used to it, it's like, uh, it's not so bad. Ooh, definitely not that color. Oops. Someone's asking, why did you choose animals for your comics? I've like always loved animals. I like, um, my parents like joke that when I was a kid, I used to say that like, I was, I like, I'm going to work in a zoo or I'm going to make a zoo I, like, and have pet monkeys and stuff. Like I've always been obsessed with animals and pets. And um, also from a very young age, like I've been obsessed with comic strips um i like still love calvin and Hobbes and the far side and like i was reading those jokes before like i even got them like i i could understand half the jokes um so it really was like a perfect melding of like two interests and the fact that like um is definitely something that i could do more long term just without having, keeping it broad um, just makes it easier, obviously, for me to continue to come up with jokes. So I think I'm going to do his patterning like uh, um, just with the color. It's starting to get there. Justine's asking, when you draft your punchlines, do you focus on delivering the joke or sharing something relatable? Like if um, sometimes when I'm coming up with a joke, I'll try to start it with something relatable, but always trying to finish it like with something new, like a joke, like um, just trying to ground the joke in the relatable thing and then doing something new. But that's definitely been a, um, like one of the ways that the comic has evolved is um, kind of following that formula now more so than it was before. Like recently, um, trying to think of a, um, like people can be like, oh, dog barking at, at the neighbor is a common thing that people will write a joke about. And I was like, what can I say new about this? Or how can I tell this relatable thing in my own way? And that was like one of the comics I did was the dog is saying like, um someone's breaking into the house disguised as a neighbor and it's like this the same relatable thing just like a different way to say it go a little lighter here I like, um, actually really enjoy coloring them just because I'm like, oh, okay, now it looks like a snake. At least more than it did before. 
yeah the color is bringing it to life yeah and then um sometimes i'll go in and add, go like change the size to add in details and like i actually like drawing fish and reptiles because i really think that these little touches make like a big uh kind of have a, a big effect on the comic or have the look of it like still like i'm not going crazy with the detail like this is still consistent with um you know my brand of comics but just that little bit like just gives shape to the rattle so we can judge this comic by the snake not the chihuahua chihuahua still needs some work <laughs> but it's definitely yeah. getting Tia in the chat is suggesting adding a couple S's to dangerous. <laughs> oh, that's, that's actually a clever idea. Dangerous. Yeah, especially with the tongue out, right? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, I like the addition of the scales too. Someone in the chat said you don't need to draw all the scales, but su just to suggest them, that's cool. I just like did a typo and put a Z and I was like, that'd be really funny. People are like, I don't understand. Like, is that supposed to be a joke? <laughs> yeah, that dialogue might still change. Um, in comparison to this, now I'm like, okay, this dog is really maybe too yellow. Um, just see if this made him too dark. Maybe that, maybe they're too similar. I don't know. But um, you know, at least these last two frames will be quick. Someone wants to know, do you have any pets? I have two cats, Salem and Pepper. They are both a year old. And um, the we have a black cat named Salem who we actually got in Salem, Massachusetts. It's like the most, I know it's the most generic black cat name, but we have good reason to name her Salem. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have a, uh, I have two cats at home. And actually when I'm drawing, I usually have one of the Salem's usually in my lap. Um, but they are definitely the inspiration behind a lot of cat comics because they are insane in both just like utter opposites. So I feel like between the two of them that I can cover like every, every relatable experience anyone has had with cats with these two cats. that happening well i'm definitely gonna adjust those eyes a little bit where's the outline I know I'm drawing this a little bit out of order, but I want to make sure this last panel really lands. We have another question from YouTube. What's the hardest part in learning an animal's anatomy? Do you recommend any good books or tips for animal anatomy? 
Um, I'm not great at it, so I wouldn't. I don't know if I take any tips from me, but um, I mean, obviously, looking at pictures for reference, and I think that um, drawing a cat and dog is like. I think both of them are really difficult. And I think if you can draw either of them well, like that's a good place to practice. Um, I can definitely use practice drawing cats and dogs. Like I said, I like drawing reptiles, like drawing fish and turtles is so much easier. Um, like I said, I think people have a, like people know what a chihuahua should look like. Um, people know what a cat should look like. So it's just like, I don't know. I guess you, you open yourself up to more judgment by drawing something that people already have an expectation of. But I can't think of any books off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't think that's right. It's close. Do you think you'll ever release another book? I think so. I actually have um, like a kid's book draft that I really like. I like love kid's books. And um, I have a lot of ideas for different ones. And I have one that has stuck um, for a while now. I just have to get around to actually drawing it. But the dialogue is done and I would love to do a lot of them like do a lot of kids books um, as far as they can talk I you know maybe there's like another edition in the future but at least in my head now I there are kids books that I'd like to do that are like funny kids books Like I remember, I mean, I don't know how, how old I was, but the Stinky Cheese Man and Other Fairly Stupid Tales, I think is the name of the book. Like I remember I was really little reading that book and be like, I want to write books like this. Like no lesson to it, no moral, just a funny book for kids to kids to like. So that's that's the plan. I remember that book like vividly, actually. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's wicked funny. It was like the true story of the three little pigs i think was the other one that was like super popular and it was like around the same time that and it's like the same author and illustrator i think super unique illustrations but yeah i, I love that book I know this seems like uh might seem like a little pointless to like redraw the same exact thing, but I always, always do this. And I remember once on Reddit, someone commented and said, I really appreciate the fact that you don't just copy and paste your frames. And I was like, that's why I did it for that one person to notice. <laughs> that one person. <laughs> yeah. But I've, I've always done it. I've, I like, uh, I don't, I want it to look as less, like, not as less digital as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah, I see where you're going with it. So there's little subtle nuances in each frame. Yeah. I'm not opposed to, I mean, if people want to just copy and paste, but I just like, uh, just what I've done. Let's get in there.
There you go. I'm just like reading it over to like, you know, see how I read it. Try to anticipate how other people will read it. And I think that it's uh, it's close to what I want. It's just a case of coloring. I don't know if I'll end up keeping. Um, this or not. I might. But yeah, I think the, the biggest thing and obviously like every comic, but specifically with this is like this last frame is is read correctly. Like the fact that the Chihuahua is um, he just doesn't feel threatened at all when he should. And like, he's not concerned about that. Otherwise the joke, there's no joke. I'm like hesitant to color these last two frames because I'm like, I don't know if I should have changed the saturation on him looking at him now, he looks a little dead. <laughs> Wrong layer. Do you guys have any thoughts on the expression of the dog in the last panel? It's funny because like if I when I read the comics aloud, I just naturally have more of a like a deadpan delivery. And it's like that's not always how, how to read the comics. So what do like, you guys I, think of the the Chihuahua's face in the last panel? Something I read before was that this doesn't really apply to my comics, but maybe a little bit, was that like Bill Watterson didn't want Calvin Hobbes animated. He didn't want people to, he didn't want to give Calvin and Hobbes a voice because like everyone already had in their head what the voice was. And he's like, that's like the, the one they should have. Everyone loves it. Nice. They said the expression is great. And that it's relatable. <laughs> So you also color each panel individually too, then you don't copy the color over as well. Yeah, which I know is like, like why do I, why do you do that? But I don't know, I just do it. I, and I think like when I go in to add the little details and stuff, like those will intentionally be different in each panel. And um, I don't know, it's like the hard work is done. So this is kind of just the fun part. So like it's enjoyable to do these, to color them in and stuff. Like I said, getting the layout done and then being like, yeah, this joke is delivered correctly. After that, um, like the rest of drawing it in is, is the fun part. Alexandra is asking, have you ever gone to any of the comic cons? And if so, what was your favorite things about them? I only did um, Boston's one. That's where I'm from, this area, Boston area. Um, last, last summer for the first time. And uh, it was awesome. Like I did not bring enough books and prints, which is like the coolest problem to have. Um, yeah, it was super cool. Like, I loved it. The fact that, like, I brought books and I was like, uh, I'll bring 50 books. And then I, like, sold out of them in two hours. And I was like, 
the rest of the day, I just had to tell people I sold out, which is cool. Like, you know, it's cool to, to sell out of the books, but um, it was super fun. And I definitely want to do it again, but obviously things are a little different now. I don't I think that all of them are canceled, but I would definitely do, them, do another one in the future for sure. Cool. I like love um, when it's, this is pretty much finished to like, again, people are going to be looking at it small, like on their phones to look at it small and zoom out and just read the comic, how people are going to read it. Be like, yeah, I think this is, uh, this is right. I think that potentially like uh, if I go and do any edits, like I can make second and third frame a little bigger. Um, I don't think I need that. Uh, I don't think those details in the wood are needed, but I can try it and see if I like it better. Um, but overall, I'm pretty happy with it. Again, that major change was like removing the snake from the first frame. Um, it also actually changed his eye line for the dog, but I still think it reads correctly. I think it looks awesome. The result. That, was, that was really weird like I, I mean it was cool to just do it live and like uh to kind of narrate myself as i'm thinking through it um yeah it did come out a little bit different than the original sketch but it's funny to look at the finished one and then look at the the sketch again at this like um areas like this pancake looking dog <laughs> Um, uh, so actually it did have two versions of dialogue at the top too. Um, so it had, that was my rattle warning you that I'm dangerous and warning you to get away because I'm dangerous. So I still think that's to be determined. Like it could change, but overall I like it. Do you guys have any questions about this comic or anything else we covered? Someone in the chat said, like, magic in four frames. And I think that's a great way to sum it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Very nice. Will we be seeing this on Sunday, or do you have something else ready? So um, something like this, I could release it. I feel like I could release it any time. So if I have something between now and Sunday that's, like, Halloween-related, like, if I get that... Um, that worm cemetery joke, like I'll probably do that just because like I have two more, two more weeks till Halloween where um, like I'd, I wouldn't want to release a Halloween joke after Halloween. So it depends if I come up with some, if I, it depends if I can crack that worm cemetery one, but if not within the next couple of weeks, for sure. I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. Awesome. Well, everyone in the audience, keep an eye out for this comic. Hopefully it'll pop up in your feed in the future. Make sure you follow Jimmy over at They Can Talk Comics on Instagram. And Jimmy, thank you so much. This was awesome. It was great to see your process and kind of hear your thoughts behind the illustration. So thank you so much for this. Thank you guys for watching. I really enjoyed this. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Also, I want to remind everybody, we do have a promo going for Comic Week. It is $300 off either Mobile Studio Pro size, and that is with Wacom Week, code Wacom Week, and we'll be dropping the um, link in the chat so you can go check it out there. We also have some awesome sessions coming up tomorrow. We have a comic battle as well as a session with Alex Sinclair, who is a colorist for DC Comics, so those should be a lot of fun. We hope you join us. Thank you so much again, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow.